¿Aló? Ahí, ya. Entonces, otra vez, buenas noches a todas y a todos. Es un gusto estar hoy. Esta es la eh, tercera conferencia magistral dentro de la conferencia, la sexta conferencia regional de trata de personas y tráfico de migrantes. Eh, para mí es un gusto inmenso presentar hoy a Nicolás de Génova. Eh, qué gusto que esté en Quito con nosotros. Y hoy eh, Nicolás va a compartir con nosotros eh, esta charla que cambió un poco su título, eh, ahí la pueden ver, es eh, Cuerpos Anónimos Cuerpos Morenos y el peligro mortal de la frontera México-Estados Unidos. Nicolás es antropólogo, él es especialista en temas de migración, de frontera, de ciudadanía, raza y trabajo. Él alineado con una tradición marxista, ha teorizado, entre otros temas, la producción legal de la ilegalidad migrante y la deportabilidad como elemento nodal del régimen de control migratorio neoliberal y también ha hecho importantes contribuciones desde la perspectiva autonomista de las migraciones y la comprensión de la migración como un movimiento político subversivo. Eh, tiene una vasta producción académica en artículos y libros, analizando la dinámica migratoria latinoamericana en Estados Unidos y recientemente la dinámica de refugiados en Europa. Eh, no voy a leerles todos los libros porque son muchos, pero entre los más relevantes está eh, Working the Boundaries, Race, Space and Illegality in Mexican Chicago, Latino Crossings, Mexican, Puerto Ricans and the Politics of Race, eh, también The Deportation Regime y está trabajando ahora en dos textos más sobre The European Question, Migration, Race and Postcoloniality. Él ha sido profesor de varias universidades en Estados Unidos, en Holanda e Inglaterra y actualmente es profesor investigador del Departamento de Estudios Culturales Comparados en la Universidad de Houston. Eh, le damos la palabra a Nicolás. I should start by thanking you all for being here tonight. Um, and I want to thank Soledad for the gracious in, uh, introduction as well as the organizers for uh, the gracious invitation to be here. It's a pleasure uh, and um, I'm very happy to join you here tonight. Um, over the last several years, we've witnessed a remarkable escalation in migrant deaths within the U.S.-Mexico border zone. Rising numbers of border deaths are no mere coincidence or accident of geography, but rather a predictable result of U.S. immigration lawmaking, as well as a systemic feature of the routine functioning of the increasing physical fortification of the border and the increasing militarization of border enforcement tactics and technologies. Uh, indeed, for several years now, the U.S. border regime has actively converted the most rugged terrain of the border zone, particularly the desert, uh, the Sonora Desert, into a veritable mass grave. Since 1998, more than 6,951 men, women, and children are documented to have lost their lives while crossing the U.S.-Mexico border. On average, that means at least one person has died every day for the last 20 years. The real number is inevitably higher. It's estimated that there are two additional deaths for every recovered body since remains are quickly consumed by the desert heat and lost beneath shifting sands. On a global scale, intensified and increasingly militarized enforcement at border crossings of easiest passage relegates illegalized migrant and refugee mobilities into zones of more severe hardship and potentially 
lethal passage. The escalation of migrant deaths along the U.S.-Mexico border, therefore, bears a striking resemblance to the parallel, but still more extreme, proliferation of migrant and refugee deaths instigated by the severities of the European border regime, particularly in crossing the Mediterranean Sea. In the Mediterranean, untold tens of thousands of refugees, migrants, and their children have been consigned to horrific, unnatural, premature deaths by shipwreck and drowning, often following protracted ordeals of hunger, thirst, exposure, and abandonment on the high seas, supplying graphic spectacles of a seemingly unrelenting succession of human catastrophes. Of course, as the U.S.-Mexico border abundantly verifies, the option of illegalized travel by land routes is also treacherous. Hunger, thirst, exposure, abandonment, and the related lethal risks are not the exclusive travails of illegalized maritime journeys. Indeed, the borders of Europe have been effectively externalized across the entire expanse of the Sahara Desert, creating the conditions of possibility for an escalation in border zone deaths across a vast geography that precedes these perilous sea journeys. Notably, while such, such lethal land journeys bear a striking resemblance to the deadly landscapes associated with the similarly extended U.S. border zone, a significant difference is that the extended, externalized borders of Europe ensure that migrants and refugees commonly die before they ever set foot on European soil. Whereas the U.S.-Mexico border also extends itself inward and ensures that migrant deaths occur disproportionately only after having actually crossed the territorial border line. The fortification of various forms of border barricades inevitably serves to channel illegalized human mobility into ever more perilous pathways and ensures that even despite having succeeded to cross the border, many migrants never, in fact, arrive. Remarkably, U.S. border enforcement authorities were quite deliberate and explicit about this strategy. In a notorious 1994 strategic plan the U.S. Border Patrol wrote, and here I quote, the prediction is that with traditional entry and smuggling routes disrupted, illegal traffic will be deterred or forced over more hostile terrain, less suited for crossing. Furthermore, in addition to navigating a borderland landscape that has been made to kill, migrants must also, must also confront the sometimes deadly violence of the U.S. Border Patrol. Consider only the following examples. Anastasio Hernandez Rojas, a 42-year-old who had been in the United States since the age of 15 when he was deported, was caught in 2010 trying to recross the border to reunite with his wife and five children. He was surrounded by as many as 20 Border Patrol officers apprehended and hogtied, tasered as he pleaded for help, and beaten to death, all captured on amateur video and eventually aired on public television in the United States in 2012. Only last, only last year did the U.S. government finally settle a million-dollar lawsuit with Anastasio's widow. None of the Border Patrol agents involved in the murder were ever disciplined or fired and they were officially cleared of any wrongdoing by the U.S. Department of Justice in 2015. Also in 2010, Sergio Hernandez Guereca, a 15-year-old Mexican boy, was playing games with his friends in the dry riverbed of the, Rio Gran of the Rio Grande, the Rio Bravo, between El Paso and Ciudad Juarez. The four boys dared one another to run up a concrete incline and touched the barbed wire of the U.S. border fence. 
after one of the four was apprehended by a U.S. Border Patrol agent, Sergio was shot in the head by that same agent from 60 feet away as he was running away. There were numerous witnesses on a nearby bridge. The Border Patrol agent justified the killing by accusing the boys of throwing stones at him, although there was no, not even reliable evidence of that. The case finally was heard by the U.S. Supreme Court only last year. The legal dispute concerned whether or not Sergio's parents, who are citizens of Mexico, had any legal right whatsoever to sue for damages under the U.S. Constitution because the boy was already back on Mexican territory when the U.S. agent murdered him. In other words, the defense of the federal government of the United States was that the case should be tried by a Mexican court because the death occurred in Mexico. However, the U.S. refused. Uh, should I start again from somewhere further back? Les preguntamos, ¿continúa o él pregunta si debe retroceder un poco en lo que estaba diciendo? Continúa. You keep on. From the point you you left. Sí. Sí. Bueno. To start again, okay. So the other option, another option, is, is that there's, there's a mic here. I need to be next to you. I need to hear you next. I need to stand next to you. Okay. Ya retomo, aló. Eh, hemos tenido un pequeñito problema logístico.
pero en este instante lo resolvemos, vamos a tratar dos veces a ver si funciona la conexión del audio con la traducción eh, y si no, eh, vamos a hacer una segunda, un segundo plan B. Nicolás. Bueno. So we're just testing it. Shall I just continue to talk? Pequeños problemas técnicos. Shall I keep talking? No, he's shaking his head no. So is it is it that you're not? No entiendo exactamente qué es el problema, pero Ya está. You can hear me now. Okay. And este Yeah, that'd be great. Rodrigo Rodrigo, you can hear me now? Do you, do you hear me now? Hola, nos están escuchando? Nos escucha la traducción? <laughs> Aló? Sí, están escuchando? No. No. Él no escucha. Sí, 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 entendemos. Wow. ¿Aló? ¿Ahí? ¿Ahí está? ¿Sí? ¿Sí? Ok. So. Once upon a time, when <clears throat> once upon a time when I was a young revolutionary. No. Yes or no? It's good. You can hear me. Okay. All right. So, once upon a time when I was a young revolutionary, we used to say, technical problems can be solved. Yes. Parece que sí. So, I'll just, I'll just pick up from the second example. Uh, so also in 2010, Sergio Hernandez Quereca, a 15-year-old Mexican boy, was playing games with his friends in the dry riverbed of the Rio Grande, Rio Bravo, between El Paso and Ciudad Juarez. The four boys dared one another to run up the concrete incline and touch the barbed wire of the US border fence. After one of the four was apprehended, 
by a U.S. Border Patrol agent. Sergio was shot in the head by that same U.S. Border Patrol agent from 60 feet away as he was running away with his, <laughs> with his back turned. Uh, there were numerous witnesses on a nearby bridge. The Border Patrol agent justified the killing by accusing the boys of throwing stones at him, although there was not even any reliable evidence of that. The case finally was heard by the U.S. Supreme Court only last year. The legal dispute concerned whether or not Sergio's parents, who are citizens of Mexico, had any legal right whatsoever to sue for damages under the U.S. Constitution because the boy was already back on Mexican territory when the U.S. agent murdered him. In other words, the defense of the U.S. federal government was that the case should be tried by a Mexican court because, because the death occurred in Mexico. However, the U.S. refused to extradite the Border Patrol agent to be put on trial in Mexico. In effect, this means that the Border Patrol can kill Mexicans and other Latin Americans crossing the border across the border in Mexico with impunity. And notably, that case was argued under the, Ob the Obama administration. Similarly, earlier this year, on April 23rd of 2018, a jury returned with a not guilty verdict on the second degree murder charge against Border Patrol agent Lonnie Schwartz and was unable to reach a verdict on two lesser charges. Schwartz killed 16-year-old Jose Antonio Elena Rodriguez on October 10th, 2012. On that night, Schwartz targeted Jose Antonio, firing 16 bullets in 34 seconds from three different positions, shooting through the border fence in Nogales, Arizona, and striking Jose Antonio 10 times, eight times in the back and twice in the head. Forensic analysis proved that Jose Antonio was already on the ground when Schwartz continued to fire his gun from the other side of the border fence, demonstrating the agent's deliberate and reckless disregard for human life. A report conducted by the Department of Homeland Security Agency that oversees the Border Patrol detailed 67 Border Patrol shootings in the two-year period from 2010 to 2012, on average nearly three per month, and admitted that in most cases there was no reasonable justification whatsoever for the use of deadly force. Likewise, migrants must confront the less systematic but no less systemic physical attacks of anti-immigrant racists organized into border vigilante militias. Nevertheless, we see not only the outright violence of border policing and the outright violence of extra-state extra state paramilitary hunting of migrants at the borderline, but also a far more widespread and insidious kind of killing at a distance. The U.S. Border Patrol deploys apprehension methods in remote areas, which commonly result in the dispersal and disorientation of migrants into life-threatening terrain. Border Patrol agents actively interfere with and destroy humanitarian aid through acts of outright vandalism or the removal of life-preserving humanitarian supplies that have been left for migrants or they routinely harass or otherwise interfere with humanitarian aid work. And various local and federal government actors engage in discriminatory practices of emergency non-response for undocumented people in the border zone. The perfectly predictable, lethal effects of border fortification consign migrants to disappearance and death by turning border crossing into a death-defying obstacle course. The evident systematicity of this structural violence, or what might be better called infrastructural violence, actively 
converts the desert into a landscape that kills. In this light, we are challenged to critically comprehend the spectacle of border policing, whether, speaking of the US or other places, in relation to its brute material effects. Above all, a ghastly accumulation of dead black and brown bodies. Whether in Europe or in the United States, the brute racial fact of these increasingly deadly border regimes is seldom acknowledged. Because recognizing that the targets of these diverse tactics of bordering are overwhelmingly black and brown people immediately confronts us with a cruel fact of post-coloniality. Simply put, in the face of the inevitable and ever more bountiful harvest of empire, past and present, the mobility of the vast majority of people from the formerly colonized countries, indeed the vast majority of humanity, has been preemptively illegalized. Given that the horrendous risk of border crossing death systematically generated by these border regimes is disproportionately inflicted upon migrants and refugees from the formerly colonized countries, the vast geography formerly known as the Third World and now more commonly rebranded as the Global South, we should be reminded here of Ruth Gilmore's poignant proposition that this sort of unequal distribution of the prospect of violence, mutilation, and death may indeed be taken as the very definition of racism. And here I quote Ruth Gilmore, Racism, she contends, is the state-sanctioned or extra-legal production and exploitation of group-differentiated vulnerability to premature death. State-sanctioned or extra-legal production and exploitation of group-differentiated vulnerability to premature death. Therefore, in the face of the escalation in border deaths, we find ourselves, in Michael Omi and Howard Winant's words, compelled to think racially. Because opposing racism requires that we notice race, that we afford it the recognition it deserves and the subtlety it embodies. The fervent fortification of the borders of the world's richest countries may thus be understood to be nothing less than yet another redrawing of the global color line. Over the last few years, in the European context, we've become accustomed to ubiquitous and virtually unanimous proclamations. In mass-mediated public discourse and dominant political debate regarding a quote-unquote crisis of migration and refugee movements. The border spectacle of mass death in the Mediterranean in particular has intensified the contradictions of an increasingly militarized border that has had to also paradoxically shoulder the burden of a kind of minimalist humanitarianism, whereby border patrols become implicated in rescue operations. Even as every rescue remains haunted all the same by the horizon of arrest, detention, and deportation. In Europe, in other words, there is nonetheless a dominant discourse that widely acknowledges the border deaths as horrific tragedies, even as it seeks to disingenuous, disingenuously blame the so-called criminals, the predatory smugglers and human traffickers. Yet comparatively, there is a stunning silence around the accumulating border deaths in the U.S.-Mexico border zone. And only an ever more shrill and bellicose outcry for more border enforcement. It's as if the hegemonic common sense in the United States is that daring to defy U.S. borders inasmuch as this is ubiquitously framed as an illegal act, a violation of the law, pure and simple, could only be understood in terms of migrants taking their lives into their own hands 
and deserving, or at least bearing the responsibility for whatever the consequences. It is as if in the United States, the callous common sense about border deaths is they were asking for it. Whether in the United States or Europe or elsewhere, through measures that intensify the policing of physical territorial borders, we all become largely unwitting witnesses to a grand spectacle where the border is staged and where we may, we may be led to believe in the elusive specter of its violation by the seemingly devious and cunning migrants who transgress it. This is what I have called the border spectacle, a spectacle of enforcement at the border, whereby migrant illegality is rendered spectacularly visible. The material practices of immigration and border policing thereby become enmeshed in a dense weave of discourse and representation and generate a constant redundancy of still more of these languages and images. Thus the border spectacle sets a scene, a scene of ostensible exclusion where allegedly unwanted or undesirable or in any case unqualified or ineligible migrants must be stopped, kept out, turned around. As a scene of exclusion, the border appears to demonstrate and verify and legitimate the purported naturalness and the putative necessity of such exclusion repeatedly, redundantly. Through these emphatic and grandiose gestures of exclusion, border enforcement performatively activates the image of migrant illegality as a seemingly real thing, as an apparently objective truth. The spectacle of enforcement ensures that the border can be represented as out of control, beleaguered by invasions or floods, of so-called illegal migrants or refugees. A more or less constant border spectacle of policing and physical fortification thus appears to verify both the illegality and disorder of seemingly uncontrollable migrant movements as well as lend credibility and reality to the otherwise elusive border itself. Migrants can only become quote unquote illegal, however, if they have been, if there have been legislative or enforcement based measures to render particular migrations or types of migration illegal. That is to illegalize them. From this standpoint, there are not really so called illegal migrants or migrations so much as illegalized migrants and migrations. The origins of such illegalizations are usually located where very few of us can ever see them plainly because they're the product of lawmaking and they arise from the deliberations, debates and decisions of lawmakers. This is what I've called the legal production of migrant illegality. The legal production of migrant illegality or more specifically the legal production uh, of Mexican migrant illegality in the work that I did earlier on in my career. Consequently, the migrants who die crossing the U.S.-Mexico border are overwhelmingly Latina or Latino and disproportionately Mexican. Assessing the real effects of this deadly border, therefore, we are left to ask, do brown lives matter within the U.S.-Mexico border and immigration regime? Analogous to the police beating of Rodney King and the Los Angeles Rebellion in 1992 following the acquittal of the brutalizers, which Omi and Wynan astutely identified as a watershed moment for racial politics in the United States, and likewise analogous to the contemporary Black Lives Matter movement's politicization of racist police killings inordin inordin inordinately perpetrated against African American males across the United States, 
we are challenged to discern the comparably momentous racial significance of the deadly border regime. And we must recognize the contemporary controversy around immigration in the United States as inseparable from our wider multifaceted historical moment of racial crisis. It is well known and a resounding and well-deserved source of Donald Trump's infamy that he invoked a luridly criminalized and racialized specter of so-called illegal migration, particularly from Mexico, as one of the defining centerpieces of his campaign for the US presidency when he delivered a speech on June 16th, 2015 that officially announced his candidacy and launched his campaign. It's instructive to examine the precise language that Trump deployed. Here I quote, when do we beat Mexico at the border? They're laughing at us, at our stupidity. And now they're beating us economically. They're not our friend, believe me, but they're killing us economically. The U.S. has become a dumping ground. The U.S. has become a dumping ground for everybody else's problems. When Mexico sends its people, they're not sending the best. They're sending people that have lots of problems. And they're bringing those problems. They're bringing drugs. They're bringing crime. They are rapists. And some, I assume, are good people. But I speak to border guards, and they're telling us what we're getting. Not the right people. It's coming from more than Mexico. It's coming from all over South and Latin America. And it's coming probably, probably, from the Middle East but we don't know because we have no protection." End quote. Trump then went on to rally his supporters with his infamous proposal for the construction of a border wall along the full extent of the nearly 2,000 mile U.S.-Mexico land border. I will build a great, great wall on our southern border, he declared, in response to ensuing media furor over his flagrantly anti-Mexican remarks Trump was compelled to release a statement to address charges of racism. He wrote, and I quote again, I don't see how there is any room for misunderstanding or misinterpretation of the statement I made. What can be simpler or more accurately stated? The Mexican government is forcing their most unwanted people into the United States. They are, in many cases, criminals, drug dealers, rapists, etc. The worst elements in Mexico are being pushed into the United States by the Mexican government. The largest suppliers of heroin, cocaine, and other illicit drugs are Mexican cartels that arrange to have Mexican immigrants trying to cross the borders and smuggle in the drugs. The Border Patrol knows this. Likewise, tremendous infectious disease is pouring across the border. The United States has become a dumping ground for Mexico. The issues I have addressed and continue to address are vital steps to make America great again." End quote. Now in this statement, not only was Trump recalcitrant about his allegations, but in fact amplified them and extended them now to insinuate that Mexican migrants are also carriers of infectious diseases, thus further figuring the Mexican menace as a multifarious threat of criminality, violence, sexual predation, and contagion. In a dissimulation of the toxicity of his racist appeal, notably, Trump was careful to reinstate the divisive figure of migrant illegality as the real object of his animus. He said, many fabulous people come in from Mexico and our country is better for it, but these people are here legally and are severely hurt by those coming in illegally." End quote. Anti-Mexican racism in particular and anti-Latino racism more generally have thus been a potent and viral fermenting agent in the long saga of anti-immigration politics in the United States for the greater part of the last century, especially since the landmark reconfiguration of the legal infrastructure of immigration in 1965 is associated with what I've described as the legal production of migrant illegality in ways that were disproportionately harmful for Mexicans in particular and disadvantageous for Latin Americans more generally. Literally from the very outset of his bid for the presidency then, Trump's political strategy has depended on castigating 
Mexican and other Latino migrant illegality as, and excoriating the phantasm of a purportedly open U.S.-Mexico border as pivotal elements in his rather crass mobilization of anti-Mexican racism in particular and anti-immigrant nativism more generally. Notably, the call to refortify the U.S.-Mexico border was simultaneously affiliated with anti-Muslim racism by implicitly raising the securitarian spectacle of terrorism and invoking the specter of a porous border with Mexico that can be readily exploited by so-called enemies from the Middle East. Trump's forlorn litany of how the United States has become the dumping ground for everybody else's problems, particularly as embodied in the proverbial hordes of unwanted migrants, was conjoined in that same speech to the portentous contention that the United States is becoming a third world country. Furthermore, what is particularly striking for present purposes is that the racialized figures of Mexican rapists, drug smugglers, disease, and criminality in general were amplified in Trump's discourse to encompass all of Latin America. Thus, the mobility of Latino migrants itself is implicated in the spectacular discourse that, that conjures an image of migration as a destabilizing, unwelcome intrusion and as a corrosive, unwanted presence. After all, much as the U.S.-Mexico border has long been conventionally understood to be the place where Latin America begins, so also was it ideologically figured as the place where the third world begins. Hence Trump's bombastic project of making America great again has been inseparable from the injunction to build a wall that promises to insulate the United States from Latin America and keep the, cont the contagion of Latino migrants out, recapitulating the centuries-long legacy wherein Latin America conjured a frontier space where aggressive European colonial powers projected their fears, fantasies, and desires. This distinctly beleaguered articulation of U.S. nationalism similarly requires Latin America to supply a figure of racialized otherness that is always dangerously close. Earlier this year, the discursive criminalization of the undocumented came to be particularly focused on undocumented youth, widely known as dreamers, who have generally been raised and educated in the United States after having been brought to the country as children by their migrant parents. The divisive moral economy of eligibility for a so-called path to citizenship has been abundantly manifest in efforts to ideologically recuperate some dreamers, namely those who've been able to qualify for Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, or DACA, by repudiating and commonly criminalizing those undocumented youth and other undocumented migrants who could not satisfy the program's stringent eligibility requirements. This pernicious bifurcation was amplified to the point of grotesque caricature in Trump's State of the Union address on January 30th of this year, in which he exploited tragic stories of street violence in Latino communities in order to supplant the figure of the meritorious dreamer with the spectacularized figure of what he called the savage gang MS-13, who he alleged with characteristic contempt for the truth, quote, took advantage of glaring loopholes in our laws to enter the country as unaccompanied alien minors, end quote. So invoking the lurid image of a deliberate and devious manipulation of U.S. immigration law by criminals intent to infiltrate the United States, Trump insinuated that such migration is tantamount to home invasion, underscoring that such Deadly loopholes have allowed MS-13 and other criminals to break into our country, as he said. Emphatically juxtaposing the question of immigration and implicitly the prospect of regularization and naturalization for dreamers, juxtaposing these to U.S. citizens' purported right to the American dream, as he put it, 
Trump invoked his duty, the sacred duty of every elected official in this chamber, he said, to protect our citizens, to defend Americans, because Americans are dreamers too. Here, of course, Trump elided Americanness with U.S. citizenship. And this was a deliberate intervention that directly repudiated the claims of the claims to American identity and belonging on the parts of dreamers. Thus, if the ideological script that has legitimated the dreamers has reinvigorated classic impulses in U.S. nationalism that celebrate the U.S. as a proverbial country of immigrants, that same discourse has been intransigent about sorting and ranking the so-called good ones from the so-called bad ones, systematically disqualifying the predicaments of other illegalized migrants and their children and repudiating their dreams and desires has merely exposed the deeper contradictions that situate the undocumented and Latinos very prominently among them at the center of the contemporary immigration debate in the United States. Still more recently, during the late spring and early summer of this year, the U.S.-Mexico border also became the spectacular scene of a bewildering and appalling crisis alternately depicted as a scene of brazen migrant invasion and infiltration or of, alternately, the desperate arrival of refugees seeking asylum. Under direct orders from the Trump administration through Attorney General Jeff Sessions' notorious Zero Tolerance Memorandum issued in April of this year, Central American migrant and refugee families have found themselves targeted at the spectacular center of the repugnant atrocity of state-sponsored kidnapping and child abuse perpetrated by the U.S. Border Patrol. And the superintendents of the children's secretive internment following their abduction from their parents. Through this perverse mass-mediated spectacle of caging, encampment, and veritable torture of Latino infants and toddlers and other children and their protracted indefinite abduction from their migrant or refugee parents, the Trump regime already notorious for its wild governmental recklessness, unprecedented incompetence, flagrant corruption, criminal, conspir con criminal conspiracies large and small, and authoritarian disdain for the rule of law, the Trump regime with <coughs> with this atrocity casually but deliberately secured for itself an infamy of historic proportions haunted by analogies with African American slavery, Native American coercive assimilation, Japanese American internment, and indeed the Nazi Holocaust. Thus the topical and thematic concerns of Latino studies have quite literally been repeatedly catapulted into the center stage of US politics. In this regard, Latino studies scholarship and research in border and migration studies in particular provides crucial insights that deepen our understandings of the centrality of anti-Mexican or anti-Latino racism in the contemporary immigration debate and the ongoing and unresolved racial crisis in the United States more generally. Trump's callous and vicious cruelty above all put on grotesque display in the family separation policy is indisputably reprehensible, but there's virtually nothing in Trump's anti-Mexican or anti-Latino racism that is truly new in any way. It is undeniably more brazen in its nativist vulgarity and more unabashed and unapologetic in its racism than what had become customary during the Obama administration and for this very reason may seem more appalling and repugnant to many who may have been comforted by the avowed, if, if insincere, post-racialism of the Obama years. After all, deportation has always been a de facto policy of family separation.
and deportations reached a record high, an historic level, unmatched in US history under Obama. But like the man himself, there is woefully little in Trump's political rhetoric that is original or creative in any way. The US-Mexico border has long been a premier site for the deployment of increasingly militarized tactics and technologies of enforcement, including, of course, more than 640 miles of existing physical barricades that already partition the most densely populated and easily crossed portions of the border. The unrelenting reinforcement of the US-Mexico border as a presumptively legitimate response to the putative problem of so-called illegal migration has long been a standard fallback position for all US immigration politics. When in doubt, the logic goes, further militarize, securitize, or simply barricade the intractable, intractable border with Mexico. Hence, when Trump incites his supporters with the utterly unrealistic, implausible notion of building a wall, it is little more than a hyperbolic expression of what has otherwise been a rather routine fixture of US immigration policy and the degeneration of a long-standing and, and perennial but increasingly deadly border spectacle into an asinine but no less reckless and vicious farce. The ceaseless fortification of the US-Mexico border, that infamous partition that was always supposed to be where Latin America ended, presents the epitome of what I've depicted as a spectacle of exclusion, but a spectacle of exclusion that mystifies its own obscene secret, the permanent subordinate inclusion of illegalized, predominantly Latin American migration. Such spectacles of border enforcement conceal the fact that even those migratory movements which are officially prohibited, branded as illegal, and supposed to be absolutely unwanted and rejected are in fact, objectively speaking, actively encouraged and enthusiastically facilitated. So-called illegal and officially unauthorized migrations are, to various extents, actively and deliberately imported and welcomed by prospective employers as a highly prized variety of labor power. Thus, the increasing fortification of the US-Mexico border in its grand and ever increasingly deadly performance of exclusion is permanently accompanied, nonetheless, by the ever enduring fact of illegalized migration. So the scene of exclusion is always accompanied by its obscene underbelly, which is subordinate, illegalized inclusion. Consequently, the brute fact, the brute fact is that some border crossers die while many others survive and prevail in their illegalized migratory projects. Thus, the outright disposability of migrant lives, so routinely verified by the deadly border, cannot be seen as a purely necropolitical phenomenon. Border policing has plainly become cruel, indeed murderous, but it is not about cruelty pure and simple and not exclusively about mass murder. The blunt truth is that some migrants must die, that is to say some are killed and many more are made to die, yet most survive as illegalized migrants who may then continue and proceed from this deadly endurance test to commence their lifelong careers as precarious, ever deportable workers. The largely anonymous brown bodies that populate the US-Mexico border zone as often unidentified and unidentifiable corpses must be apprehensible as specifically Latino migrant lives. We're confronted, therefore, not only with a lethal border, a border that kills, 
but one that contributes also systematically to the production of Mexican and other Latino lives as disposable. The deadly border does not only kill, but also plays a productive role. Its power is productive, crucial for the continuous production and reproduction of Latino lives as disposable, deportable labor power. Hence we begin to see not only the cruel extremities of U.S. border control as a regulatory regime, but also the regularities that it truly produces. Foremost among them, the very irregularity or illegality of so-called illegal migration. In a de facto process of artificial selection, these deadly obstacle courses have long served to sort out the most able-bodied, disproportionately favoring the younger, stronger, and healthier among prospective labor migrants, and likewise disproportionately favoring men over women. Admittedly, as the violence of the border achieves unprecedented levels of excess, even this process of filtering and sorting becomes partly counterproductive as many of these healthy and fit bodies are subjected to heightened risks of mutilation, maiming, and trauma. Nonetheless, there's a profound continuity between ever rising border body counts and the disposability of life at the borders of the United States with the deportability of illegalized migrant labor. There's a continuity between the abject disposability of these lives through a border that kills and their deportability as migrant workers. The vicious severities of these extended and expansive border zones present a fierce endurance, tense, a fierce endurance test whether we're speaking of the United States or Europe, a fierce endurance test, a preliminary apprenticeship in what promises to be a more or less protracted career of migrant illegality, precarious labor, arduous exploitation, and deportability. And yet, migrants' needs, desires, and aspirations always supersede this death-defying obstacle course. Migrants' needs, desires, and aspirations always supersede this death-defying obstacle course, even if it is at the cost of their lives. The militarization and ostensible fortification of borders, as a result, proved to be much more reliable for enacting a strategy of capture than for functioning as mere technologies of exclusion once migrants have successfully navigated their way across such borders, and this has been abundantly verified by the reinforcement of the U.S.-Mexico border, once across, the onerous risks and costs of departing and later attempting to cross yet again become inordinately prohibitive and for many, truly unthinkable. Rather than Rather than keeping illegalized Latino and other migrants out, therefore, the militarization of the border simply tends to trap the great majority of those who succeed to get across, now caught indefinitely inside the space of the U.S. nation state as a very prized kind of highly vulnerable migrant labor. Thus, in spite of the dominant discourse that the U.S. immigration system and border enforcement regime are quote-unquote broken, and in spite of the perennial appearance of the U.S.-Mexico border's seeming inadequacy or dysfunction, the border has long served quite reliably and predictably as a filter for the subordinate illegalized inclusion of migrant labor from Latin America. Migrant illegality always has a history within each particular juridical and border enforcement context. Similarly, present-day border policing and immigration enforcement confirm that such histories are never finished. Rather than fait accompli, established once and for all time, these diverse and historically specific productions of migrant illegality 
must continue to be reproduced through ongoing struggles over bordering and rebordering. Notably, these border making and border enforcing activities have been increasingly and pervasively relocated to sites within the interior of migrant receiving states, such that illegalized migrants and refugees are made in effect to carry the border on their very bodies as border enforcement becomes a deportation regime and the border comes to permeate the full spectrum of everyday life activities and spaces associated with what I call the migrant metropolis. Thus as quote unquote problems for the government of transnational human mobility and so-called migration management, these processes of illegalization remain the open-ended sites for border struggles and unforeseen disputes over migrant and refugee politics. Nonetheless, the border formations of state power and sovereignty and immigration law and politics more generally must be understood to be reaction formations. They react to the primary exercise of an elementary freedom of movement through diverse tactics and techniques of bordering. In this respect, these two key figures, the autonomy of migration and the tactics of bordering are central to and mutually constitutive of the agonistic, if not antagonistic drama that repeatedly manifests itself as the pervasive so-called crisis of borders. Indeed, these border crises are really a crisis of what is finally an effectively global border regime, responding everywhere to these human movements and their double-faced, double-voiced politics of mobility and presence. And on that note, I'll stop. Mucha, aló, aló, ahí y listo. Muchísimas gracias, Nicolás, por ese provocativo eh, discurso, esa provocativa conferencia que nos has dado y disculpas otra vez por los problemas de infraestructura logística. <risa> Tienen, eh, tenemos tiempo para preguntas del público, así que Abro el espacio para eh, preguntas, hacemos una primera ronda y Nicolás puede responder. Ah, necesitamos… ¿Necesitas traducción? ¿No? Ok. ¿Sí? Adelante, ¿tienen alguna pregunta? Eh, una aquí, otra acá y otra allá. Eh, comencemos, por favor. Gracias, muy amable, gracias por la presentación que provocó muchas ideas. Estoy, tengo una pregunta de información, disculpe si no sea clara, pero puede hablar tal vez de la relación que en cuándo se estableció el Homeland Security en el 2002 con, como una reacción al terrorismo, al ataque a Torre Gemelas y las estrategias que están empleando en, en la frontera. Sí, para elaborar puedo dar. Gracias. Acá había otra pregunta, por favor. Buenas tardes, doctor Nicolás, gracias por su presentación. Eh, felicitaciones por esa sensibilidad humana y esos estudios. Quería preguntarle en su experiencia qué capacitación tiene la Guardia o las autoridades migratorias en relación con derechos humanos, si hay algún tipo de avance al respecto. Gracias. Gracias. Acá había otra pregunta más y ahí cerramos, Nicolás, para responder. Sí, bueno, felicitaciones, Nicolás, por la presentación. Y un pequeño comentario y una pregunta. El comentario en relación a Donald Trump, vos hablaste mucho de Donald Trump, y Donald Trump es un producto de la sociedad americana, una sociedad 
profundamente discriminatoria, que tiene una historia larga, digamos, de sus orígenes de discriminación. Allí está el testimonio de las comunidades afroamericanas por la conquista de sus derechos, que costó mucha sangre. Entonces, digo, por si no, queda como que Donald Trump fuera, digamos, una, una especie de, de avis raris, digamos, dentro de un, de un universo di, eh, diferente, digamos, ¿no? Y en realidad es producto, digamos, de una sociedad que es profundamente discriminatoria. Eh, eso como comentario, digamos, ¿no? para historiarlo un poco, digamos, para ponerlo en un contexto histórico más amplio. Y como pregunta, este, no sé si hay, si existen, si tenés a mano, algunos estudios que... Eh, que den cuenta del de aporte de las comunidades este, migrantes en Estados Unidos respecto del Producto Bruto Interno. Es decir, sabemos que la economía formal, la economía legal, se sostiene sobre la economía informal. Este, muchas familias americanas, digamos, este, trabajan en empresas o en el sector estatal, digamos, y las políticas de cuidado eh, son ejercidas por migrantes latinos, ¿no? muchas mujeres que son babysitter o, este, o bueno, hombres que cuidan, que, ¿no? que arreglan el jardín o que arreglan la cañería en la casa y demás. ¿no? Entonces hay un aporte importante, se me ocurre, de la comunidad latina en Estados Unidos al Producto Bruto Interno, a la producción de riqueza en los Estados Unidos. Si hay alguna cifra, si hay algún estudio, alguna posibilidad de saber algo de eso. Muchas gracias. Nicolás. Sí, sirve. Sí. Gracias por las preguntas. Sí, um, voy a contestar en inglés, pero um, para, para asegurar que me expreso efectivamente. Um, oh, no. You can hear me? Okay. So, um, <coughs> Yeah, I mean, the, the question about homeland security is a very important one. Um, and for me, is a very instructive one because the spectacle of terrorism provoked uh, a literal declaration of a state of emergency that to this day, I believe, has never been rescinded. Um, a literal state of emergency um, that obviously was dedicated first and foremost to authorizing uh, a variety of neocolonial um, invasions and warfare around the globe, but, but which in a very important way um, opened up um, a whole gamut of possibilities for, um, for, the, for the abuse of uh, basic civil liberties within the United States and introduced all kinds of new mechanisms of surveillance and, um, and so forth. Now, um, naturally, naturally, those kinds of measures um, could be most immediately and most, uh, and most comprehensively implemented first and foremost against non-citizens, and naturally, they also then very quickly began to contaminate citizenship itself. Um, but, the, but the institutionalization of a Department of Homeland Security and the folding into it of everything related to immigration, border enforcement, the eligibility of, of immigrants for naturalization as citizens, et cetera, um, meant literally that the mandate of anti-terrorism, the mandate of fighting terrorism, became the premier, uh, the premier um, sort of objective of the very governmental apparatuses that dealt otherwise with, um, you know, with everything related to immigration. Um, so this was a very kind of landmark event in the transformation of the way that um, the U.S. immigration regime operates and the way that the border, um, in the way that the border is policed as well. Um, now, obviously what it did was it created a state of exception or a kind of emergency kind of alibi for a whole variety of new kinds of much more aggressive uh, forms of surveillance and so on. Um, and, you know, various kinds of repressive repercussions. But the important thing, the, the much more important thing 
is that it transformed the larger discursive framework for everything related to migration such that the notorious, the notorious Sensenbrenner bill of 2005, the House, which was passed by the House of Representatives and would have been the absolutely most punitive anti-immigrant legislation in U.S. history, its very title coupled illegal immigration with anti-terrorism. And so that the ramifications of that securitarianism, so to speak, um, were very profound in a way that took as their premier object something that had nothing to do with terrorism, but precisely the, uh, you know, the increasing, um, increasingly punitive kind of policing of migration and the border. Um, and it was precisely that law then that became the, uh, that proposed law that had passed in the House of Representatives, the lower house, but not in the Senate, and was going forward to be debated in the Senate in 2006 that then provoked what was a truly unprecedented mass social movement um, led by undocumented migrants and their children. Um, a movement that in three months time was spectacularly successful because it derailed that law, its immediate target, completely. Um, and so in, in, a, in, in a way that is, you know, absolutely extraordinary in U.S. history, you had a mass movement of literally millions of people, overwhelmingly migrants and their children, disproportionately people of color, overwhelmingly working class, disproportionately uh, the working poor, who had in many cases no uh, legal right, no juridical right um, to participate in the debate about U.S. policy, but who succeeded through their mobilization all across the United States, in one city after another, breaking records, um, succeeded to you know completely transform um, the that the immediate context um, of migration um, politics and debate and policy. Um, of course, the immediate repercussion was also a repressive one, which then uh, reintroduced interior enforcement that brought workplace raids back after they had basically disappeared for the for the last few prior you know for the prior few years um, so you know in short I think that anti-terrorism has been absolutely crucial in the subordination of labor and subordination of migrant labor in particular um, and really is inseparable from a kind of spectacle a securitarian spectacle about ostensibly about terrorism but in a way that then is very productive for creating all kinds of other means um, to, you know, to, um, to transform the context of everyday policing, particularly for non-citizens. Um, the, the, in the question about human rights and the Border Patrol, I, um, I might have missed something in the question, but, but broadly speaking, the Border Patrol is, operates with incredible impunity. Um, because uh, it, it is literally a police force dedicated only to the, you know, to the harassment of undocumented migrants at the U.S.-Mexico border. I mean, overwhelmingly, that's its, its actual function and has been since it was created. Um, and, you know, and in fundamental ways doesn't come under the same kinds of um, legal constrictions that ordinary police forces do. So over the last several years, again, this is related to the question of anti-terrorism, what has happened on the one hand is the extension of policing immigration deep into the interior in a way that has encompassed and incorporated local, municipal, state police forces in trying to apprehend uh, you know, and, um, and initiate deportation proceedings for undocumented migrants. And so in many places it becomes possible for a migrant to be driving a car, get stopped by the police for having a, having a light that's not working, some absolutely mundane, uh, trivial kind of offense. But they can be stopped, often on the basis of racial profiling, but stopped randomly for something that appears to be unrelated to immigration, and then it can trigger a, trigger a sequence of immigration consequences. And that implicates local police in a way that never was, you know, true in the same way historically, but was kind of broadly expanded in the last, you know, in the last 10 to 15 years. Um, so on the one hand, you have that transformation. On the other hand, 
you have the continued operation of the Border Patrol as you know, one that doesn't have any of the sort of con customary um, restrictions or superintendents or uh, oversight that pertain to ordinary police and their violations of people's civil rights or human rights. Um, and so, you know, and so it becomes part of the culture of the border control, of border patrol, that that they can engage in various kinds of violence toward migrants without without consequences. And of course, when these cases have gone to court, then you have the verification of that impunity because there are no consequences when, even when people are murdered outright. Um, and. Um, you know, and then the, the other point is a very important one about the informal economy and its relationship to citizens. Because of course, in many very direct ways, even not as employers of larger em enterprises, you have a very intimate relationship between undocumented migrants and ordinary citizens because they are employed in the informal economy, doing care work for, you know, for, for children, doing care work for elderly or sickly people. Um, doing house cleaning, a whole variety of different kinds of work, um, even doing um, work related to home repairs. So you, you know, so you have people engaged, undocumented migrants engaged in day labor who make themselves available in the same kinds of uh, parking lots of stores that sell materials for doing home improvements and people can randomly hire someone for the day to come and you know, do work in their, you know, in their uh, home renovation. Um, but so in, in a variety of ways, you have these, these relationships to ordinary citizens that are, quite, um, that are quite pervasive, which makes, again, undocumented migration not some kind of secret, some kind of secret, it's a public secret, and uh, you know, not something that is hidden away from the view of most citizens, but actually something that is quite, mon quite mundane, quite banal, in the experience of many ordinary citizens, and, mm -hmm. and there is a kind of relationship of intimacy there. Gracias, Nicolás. Eh, vamos a hacer una segunda y última ronda de preguntas eh, y comienzo. Acá hay tres. Un, dos, tres. Dale, por favor. Adelante. Hola, eh, buenas tardes o casi noches. Eh, me gustaría saber si en los estudios que estás realizando actualmente sobre la Unión Europea y el tratamiento de las migraciones allí, eh, ¿encuentras diferencias fundamentales o, o, o importantes con lo que está sucedi sucediendo en Estados Unidos ahora? Porque yo que he analizado la, bueno, la llamada crisis de refugiados de 2015 en Europa y las medidas implementadas por la Unión Europea y por los distintos estados que la componen, pues Evidentemente, salvo lo que has comentado de que los muertos no se producen en suelo europeo y es todo relativo, porque hay niños que se están suicidando en, los, en el campo de Moria, en, en, en Grecia, que es un campo de refugiados en una isla griega, esto no, no aprecio, no encuentro diferencias fundamentales, es decir, la xenofobia, eh, la, el, ah, perdón, el, la mirada hacia el inmigrante indocumentado como una amenaza para la seguridad y para el bienestar, el, eh, con, bueno, utilizar el, el discurso del terrorismo, etcétera, etcétera, es prácticamente similar, nada más. Perdón, tiene que ser súper corta y precisa la pregunta porque ya nos votan. Bueno, muchas gracias, Nicolás, por tu presentación. Súper corta. Yo sí tengo una pregunta muy concreta, es eh, a partir de lo que nos planteas de cómo las políticas migratorias y de asilo y sobre todo de control fronterizo se han, digamos, construido desde el norte global, podríamos decirlo así, entre comillas, quiero saber qué repercusiones eso tiene en el sur global, porque finalmente, por ejemplo, con la crisis de Venezuela, los que más reciben migraciones son los países de la región, entonces, Quisiera saber si tú has podido analizar un poco eso y ver qué impactos podrían tener estos supuestos modelos desde el norte. Ya no avanzamos más. Cortísima, puntualísima. No, es una pregunta muy concreta. Pude visitar un centro de detención en Laredo 
y más allá de todo lo que uno pueda comentar, una de las cosas que me sorprendió fue la composición racial de quienes participan del proceso de seguridad dentro del centro. Y me preguntaba qué impacto ha tenido eh, la participación de las comunidades eh, fronterizas en, en las políticas de seguridad. ¿Ha generado algún nivel de descomposición social, por ejemplo? Okay. Muy brevemente. <coughs> este, uh, the, of course, historically, the big differences with Europe have been that um, since the end of the guest worker programs, the only real channel for undocumented migrants, uh, well, the only real channel for, for labor migrants to continue arriving in Europe was to remake themselves as refugees. Um, that is, there, there was no other option than asylum, and then the asylum regime becomes very systematically uh, predicated on suspicion and very predictably generates its own, its own object, which is the, the so-called bogus asylum seeker, the refugee, uh, the, the fake refugee, so to speak. Um, so, so in short, you know, that's, a, that's a very big difference from the U.S. regime, but it nonetheless operates as a machine for the production of migrant illegality, is in my argument, you know, that, that the asylum system that disproportionately doesn't grant asylum and rejects the vast majority of refugees seeking asylum is actually actively illegalizing them and making them quote unquote migrants. So that's one major difference. Another one, um, uh, you know, another one is that European countries don't conceive of themselves as countries of immigration. Um, so those have been historically important differences that I think have come to collapse more and more. Uh, And so, in general, I think what we see is more and more similarity all the time and more and more kind of resonance and applicability of the things that I'm describing in the American context for the European one. Um, so I'm being very short. Um, the Global South, of course, is where the vast majority of, of uh, refugees are um, and refugee movements then um, and refugee camps and so on. Have been, have been proliferating in a way that is far, far greater and um, you know, more genuinely can be called a crisis than anything that Europe has seen, you know, where it's a, a minuscule proportion of the population that make it into Europe um, and, and petition for asylum. Um, so, <clears throat> so in that sense, of course, there is a, you know, a, a very important way that Um, that the, the global management and the global governance of human mobility that is implicated by all of these border regimes systematically is involved in rendering once again the countries of the global south as basic, um, you know, as basic uh, detention camps. You know, whole countries are reduced to the status of if de facto detention camps Uh, at the borders of Europe, um, and you know, and the European Union in particular has outsourced uh, to its junior partners in its periphery, uh, in exchange for funding, um, the task of policing the borders of Europe. So people are apprehended as so-called illegal migrants, you know, in Mauritania, or um, for that matter, even south of the Sahara in Senegal or Mali, they're apprehended as illegal migrants to Europe having never set foot on European soil in their lives. Um, and so that process of externalization and the integration of the countries in the periphery of Europe um, you know, has been one expression of this larger process whereby the real burden of, of you know, these crises is being Um, is being disproportionately put on the shoulders of the, you know, the formerly colonized countries. But the important thing also to note is that that kind of externalization of the border regime that we see in Europe in a very pronounced way has also been happening in the Americas and the extension of border policing across, across Mexico and Central America and into Ecuador as well um, you know, is, a, is a crucial area where again there's a kind of, there's a kind of increasing similarity between the U.S. and Europe, also in the direction of, of the Americas. Um, and, um, and again, just trying to be 
short um, about the, the fact that we're out of time. Um, uh, if I, the last question I, you know, I think, if I understood correctly, was really about the incorporation of, um, of um, various communities on the border, particularly communities of color, particularly Mexican Americans and, uh, and other people with immigrant, um, with immigrant backgrounds into the policing of the border and, um, and that, and that kind of antagonism has been there for a long time. Uh, many of the classic civil rights struggles of Mexican Americans in the 1950s were incredibly hostile to, um, you know, so-called illegal migrants from Mexico. Um, so there's a long legacy of, of that kind of uh, perverse, insidious kind of uh, race to the bottom, where, in order to somehow garner a uh, a little something for oneself, you have to be engaged in this kind of divisive demotion of someone else. Um, but, you know, with, you know, with the increasing dependency on many of these places along the border, on the jobs that come with border policing, with the increasing, uh, with the expansion of detention facilities and, you know, and the expansion of, of various kinds of border enforcement, then they then become major sources of jobs in those areas. Um, in areas that have traditionally been among the poorest in the United States. So you have a whole variety of ways that class and race, you know, collude in, you know, in producing new kinds of antagonism even within communities that ought to have some kind of mutual recognition. Um, but I stop at that. Thank you. Muchísimas gracias, Nicolás, y gracias al público. Con esto, Thank you, everyone. <laughs> eh, Concluimos la segunda jornada de la conferencia. No se olviden que mañana comenzamos otra vez a las ocho y media en punto. Que tengan buena noche.